I came into this world anxious to uncover the meaning of things, my soul desirous to be at the origin of the world, and here I am, an object among other objects. Locked in this suffocating reification, I appealed to the other so that his liberating gaze, gliding over my body, suddenly smooth of rough edges, would give me back the lightness of being I thought I had lost, and, taking me out of the world, put me back in the world. But just as I get to the other slope, I stumble, and the other fixes me with his gaze, his gestures and attitude, the same way you fix a preparation with a die. I lose my temper, demand an explanation. Nothing doing. I explode. Here are the fragments put together by another me. Hello and welcome once again to The Spouter Inn. I'm Chris. And I'm Suzanne. And we are beginning our 2022 series by looking at Franz Fanon's Black Skin, White Masks. It's a really challenging book. I had read it years ago, and it's so interesting coming back to it now. This is my first time reading the book. And, you know, it's a book about colonialism and the experiences that Fanon and that Black men and Black people in general experienced under colonialism. And... Therefore, it feels very much not in my lane to talk about in some ways. Yeah. Uh, but that doesn't mean that I shouldn't talk about it or shouldn't be thinking about it. So I'm going to do my best. But, you know, neither of us are experts on this stuff. No, no. I, I mean, I mentioned I'd read it before, but far from being an expert in the area, um, it's a book that's had a huge amount of impact and I think has made itself felt in a lot of different ways over the decades since it appeared back in the early 1950s. So I feel like it's a it's a neat thing to reckon with, to look back at both in terms of the book itself and just sort of understanding how the what's flowed from it, to have a little bit of a better sense of that. So I think even more than usual, we'll be having links in our show notes to other people talking about it to help mm. flesh out things that we can't or won't be able to get to. Uh, but we're going to talk about it now. Yeah. And as always, trying to give a sense of how it struck us, you know, like kind of meeting the book where where we can. And as always, you know, we try to spend the first episode each year. And I know that, that this is technically the second, but, mm. you know, schedules. Uh, we like to spend the first episode each year looking at a, a book that's going to encourage us to think in directions that we haven't been thinking about or that might I expand our viewpoints. And, you know, this uh, this this feels like that. Mm -hmm. Or challenge us in certain ways. I think that we both felt that in our own ways. And thinking about how to talk about the book, I think, how can I bet? that's always a little bit of a challenge. We always spend some time discussing that and kind of not planning out the episode exactly, but just sort of figuring out where are we at in our response. And this, I think, you know, really poses a challenge. And it's a, it's a book that demands to be paid attention to that, I don't know, it's a rough book. I, that sounds kind of, kind of silly thing to say, but that's how it strikes me when I read it. Not in a bad way. You know, in other words, I, I read it and I feel like there's a demand on me. Absolutely. This is a book that is, is putting a lot of demands on on the reader uh, for a number of different reasons in a number of different ways. So let's start digging into it. Should I say a little bit about Fanon to start? Please do. He's a fascinating character, a um, uh, person uh, who was a physician, a psychiatrist, and also a political philosopher and intellectual, but also uh, really engaged in political action. He was born in Martinique, which was at that time a French colony. Uh, it's now a ter territory of the EU. And he was educated there, but also in France, where he studied medicine. And um, during that period of time, that's when he wrote uh, Black Skin, White Masks, which we'll be talking about. And he later went on to be in Algeria, which was formative for his development, both in terms of his writing and also in terms of that political activism I mentioned. He became a member of the Algerian nationalist movement um, during the period he was in Tunisia. So he was sort of throughout North North Africa. He had a very short life. Uh, he was born in 1925 and died in 1961, so only 36 years old when he died uh, of leukemia. So for such a, a short life, he had an extraordinary impact um, in his writings and also in, in his effect in his own current day. Yeah, so let's look specifically at this book, which, as you said, was originally intended as his doctoral dissertation. Yeah, he was discouraged from submitting that as his required work, apparently. But, and so he wrote something more conventional to, to, to get his degree and then published this soon after. Right. But this book was, was enthusiastically received as a book for publication. And 
What is it? It is an attempt to understand using the tools, especially of psychoanalysis, the mental condition of the black man. And he does this from a number of angles over the course of an introduction, which sort of is a bit of a manifesto, and seven chapters, and then a a, a short conclusion afterwards, which is also a bit of a manifesto, as you might imagine. He looks at the issue of the colonized black man's psyche building and experience living in the world from a number of different angles. The first chapter specifically looks at language and how it works within the colonial experience. The next two chapters are about gender and sexuality, one focusing on women's sexuality and one focusing on men's sexuality, and particularly in relationships that cross the uh, racial divide, as it was understood. Uh, chapters four and six go deeper into sort of a psychological theory about all of this and, and and more into psychoanalysis itself. And there's a really interesting chapter between them, chapter five, called The Lived Experience of the Black Man, which is in many ways, at least for a literary reader, mm. the most striking chapter in the book, perhaps in addition to the uh, manifesto-like introduction and conclusion. So we'll talk about that quite a lot. There's a seventh chapter which talks about this in more theoretical ways, thinking about how this dynamic he's been describing relates to the psychologist Adler and the philosopher Hegel. Mm -hmm. So if you're into that, (laughs) that's there. (laughs) And then we get to a conclusion which, you know, is it's interesting. It feels sort of wildly different from what's gone on before, do you think? It's in a different voice. It's in a different voice, and it feels uh, more hopeful. Maybe. Is that it's quite the word? Oriented toward the future, I would say. I get the sense of it being very much oriented toward the future. I don't know if hopeful is quite the word, but toward future action, you know, toward a horizon. Yeah. And that maybe that is hopeful in a sense, I guess. If, well, it's hopeful in the sense that it, it breaks all this down into a few broad principles, maybe, that like if we follow this, for example, and this is on the very last page, I, a man of color, want but one thing. May man never be instrumentalized. May the subjugation of man by man, that is to say, of me by another, cease. May I be allowed to discover and desire man wherever he may be. And things like that, and you know, ending with, and my final prayer, oh, my body, always make me a man who questions, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. is a very interesting uh, way to end this. In in so many ways, right? Yeah. Uh, not just in terms of like the tone and the voice, which you were bringing out, but also this addressing not the self, but the body. Oh, my body, always make me a man who questions. And I'm sure we'll be talking about embodiment and the way in which it plays out in this text, because uh, it's really, I think, striking. Yeah, we'll talk about that. But I guess I, I guess I'm thinking that saying things like "may man never be instrumentalized" kind of give you a hook to hang hopes on. Let's mm-hmm. put it that way. Mm-hmm. Even if that's a very abstract thing that may never be realizable, it it feels so in that rhetorical moment, right? It feels like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll do that first, <laughs> and then we'll be fine. Yeah, I guess another way maybe of thinking about that end, uh, that forward looking end, um, which I agree with you about the mood of it, is thinking about the way binarism functions in that whole table of contents that you were describing. You know, you're describing the structure of the book and how it starts out talking about language. And then we get kind of this paired chapters, you know, the woman of color and the white man, and then the man of color and the white woman. So again, binaries, right? You know, as in the title, black skin, white masks, right? We've got this whole set of binaries, black and white, good and bad, and male and female get kind of mapped into this, I guess you would call it hermeneutic, right? This binary hermeneutic. And so when you get to the end, one of the things that's happened is this kind of, I guess, I don't want to say transcendence, maybe that's the wrong word, but like where you're past that kind of set of binary oppositions that structures colonial discourse. And you're, you're, that's why he says at the end, um, on that same page that you're reading from, he says, the black man is not no more than the white man, right? Mm. Um, both have to move away from the inhuman voices of their respective ancestors so that a genuine communication can be born. So the idea that, you know, um, the category, the categories are going to slip away, right? And right. will be somewhere else. And I think, yeah, I don't know if the right word for that is hopeful or utopian or what, but there's definitely a forward look. Exactly. This 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 book, which has been so much of a of an archaeology of the self and of and of Fanon's situation, suddenly turns into here is the only way out, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it's not concrete ideas for what to do, but it is a set of goals and things that you can aspire to. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And also kind of he's giving anatomy of all the things that have to be unpacked. And that's the psychoanalytical part, right? That's something that has to happen not only at the level of the individual, but, and he emphasizes this, at the level of society as well. So shall we dig into that binarism a little bit more? Yeah, which I have to say, I mean, from even as early as the first time I read this book, I mean, that was what fascinated me. You know, um, the way I came to Fennel, and this is like a really long time ago, uh, I was reading Saeed's Orientalism. So this must have been like, I don't even know when, like sometime in the early 90s, I guess. And he he draws on Fennel. I just talk about him a lot, but he alludes to him, especially with regard to this idea of a kind of a Manichaean split that is a kind of absolute binarism, you know, black, white, good, bad, and so on. And he he kind of takes Fennel and also Foucault as a way of structuring what he'll say about Orientalism. And so that made me be like, oh, that sounds super interesting. So that's when that's when I read Fennel. So I was a like infant, right? And um, and so that was the thing I was really fascinated by, like w- binarism of thought and what's going on there. Um, and so I had obviously had a really limited understanding of specifically what Fennel was doing and the place he would inhabit in uh, political philosophy generally and post-colonial thought in particular. Um, but anyway, so that's an aspect of it that I think is kind of on the face of the book because of the title and because of what he puts front and center, like in that little phrase from the introduction where he says, the white man is locked in his whiteness, the black man in his blackness. I mean, the idea that everybody is trapped by this colonial discourse, you know, everybody is locked in. One of the ways that that plays out, which I, I think is one of the main takeaways a lot of people have had from this book is is the idea of a kind of story he tells a few times of a black person of a martinican let's say who is growing up learning proper french at the french school the colonist school and maybe goes to france to finish up studying and finish up becoming more french you know puts on the white mask of the title only to find out that however white he's made himself he can't get recognized as white by white society. So he can't cross over this binarism. But also, if he returns to Martinique, he can't fit in anymore because he is too white appearing for his black peers, right? So there's a strict binary, but he's, in a sense, popped out of it. He doesn't sit comfortably within the binary that the society that he's living in insists upon the reality of. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's always this kind of disruption. I think it's in chapter one where he talks about this experience of being in France and speaking French so beautifully and being, you know, as it were, like a implicitly white Frenchman and people responding with surprise. It's as if you were basically. Right. A regular. And and so it's a kind of see, it's, it's the white mask, but noticing it's a mask, right? As this kind of, I don't know, this disruption that's happening. And there's a corresponding uh, experience he describes, like you said, back when he's in Martinique. So does Fennel see any way out of this binary trap? He kind of opens up space in a really interesting way over over the chapters. Um, like we were talking about this sort of like this this binary split, this idea of black and white as two poles, poles in perpetual conflict, as he puts it, right? So so that sort of idea of this absolute split, what what he sometimes calls the, this Manichaean notion, and I don't I don't know if I should explain that term. Um, it's a term that comes from. Uh, a religion called Manichaeanism that began in the third century. Um, it's a prophet, Mani, and it's a kind of Gnosticism. And it's the idea that there's a power of good and a power of badness, you know, light against darkness and so on. And that these two opposites are continuously at war with one another, both on the level of the universe and in the individual soul. And so Fennel sort of draws this in to his account of colonial discourse. So there's this opposition, right? But there's also this space. And one of the places that this space appears um, is this neat little passage in chapter two where he's apparently talking about the Manichaean split, right? He says, black and white represent the two poles of the world, perpetual conflict, black or white. That's the question. And then he says this, I am white. In other words, I embody beauty and virtue, which have never been black. I am the color of day. I am black. I am in total fusion with the world, in sympathetic affinity with the earth, losing my id in the heart of the cosmos. And the white man, however intelligent he may be, is incapable of understanding Louis Armstrong or songs from the Congo. I am black, not because of a curse, but because my skin has been able to capture all the cosmic effluvia. I am truly a drop of the sun under the earth. 
This is a super weird little passage, I think. <laughs> I really like it because yeah. it's, it's the parallelism is beautiful, right? I am white, I am black, right? And then it, they're, they're sort of balanced against one another. But the, the relatively brief little I am white passage, you know, I am white, beauty and virtue, blah, blah, blah. Um, the black one is amplifies and expands and kind of dwarfs it and turns it back on itself, associated not with day, which white is associated with, but rather with the world in sympathetic affinity with the earth, right? Um, and my skin captures the cosmic effluvia. I am truly a drop of sun under the earth. So there's this idea of earth, darkness, right? The opposite of light, right? And that Manichaean allegory, right? Um, but a drop of sun under the earth. And so it kind of like, I mean, it's like dialectic, right? It kind of turns it out on itself so that the brightest, hottest thing, right? The drop of the sun is precisely under the earth. Anyway, so that's what I mean by opening the space. I mean, he'll go on to kind of unpack more like how to get past, how to act, how to sort of, I don't know if transcend is the right word, but how to push back against this colonial discourse or extricate oneself and one's society from it. But he begins by opening space. And I think that passage, I just love that passage because that's one of the places that he's kind of opening space with the drop of the sun. Yeah. Although it seems like transcending it isn't the first step. Right. That's not so much what this book is about. Yeah. And that's not even the right word. Like he doesn't use that word. And so I want to kind of be careful about it. But, but there's a possibility of movement past. Like, so the words he'll use will be things like uh, action, plunging. Like he, he opens space for that, but not, but it's not transcendence is not the word he uses because that would involve a kind of going beyond the bodily. And I think he's never going to do that. Right. But I think first he just wants to understand the position he's in. He wants to understand this difficult situation he finds himself in and recognize that it is the result of colonialism, that is the result of mm -hmm. things that have happened to his people by other people for various profit reasons or other reasons. And and like the ongoing result of, too. You know, in other words, it's not like that happened before and now we're past it, but it, it continues. Like the discourse is still there. You no, know, it's exactly. It's a, it's a system that he's very much living under and has grown up under and then that has built his his psyche and and warped his psyche, I think he would argue. But yes, once he's once you've sort of figured this out, like what can you do about it? What type of actions do you have to choose? And, you know, he sort of starts out talking about this in the in the very first line of the book, in the very first line of the introduction, don't expect to see any explosion today. It's too early or too late. A line which he brings up again at the beginning of that fifth chapter, uh, which we quoted at the beginning, when he's being sort of put into his place as a black person, mm. he uh, loses his temper. I lose my temper, demand an explanation, nothing doing. I explode. And then he has to put himself back together, sort of in a new shape. Or by, by another me, right? Exactly. He says, here are the fragments put together by another me. I think that's a really neat move, don't you? Yeah. And I, I, I you know, I'll, I'll, this book is occasionally a bit slippery. I don't fully know what that's supposed to mean, but I have theories. Like, I'm reading it and interpreting it. And I get the sense that, like, you know, he has exploded. His psyche has exploded. It has fallen everywhere. Like it has been shattered by this event, but there is still some him there. There is still that other me that has to now put these pieces back together to try to recover the me that should have been mm. the me that would have been if this, if this hadn't happened or to at least recognize why the other me, the me that is now here is the way it is. Mm. Yeah. I feel like, I feel like if I, I feel personally, if I knew more about the psychoanalytical framework, maybe I'd have a better way of talking about what's being described there. But I get this, the sense of is that he's talking about the ways in which the self is always, in some sense, a succession of selves. Like it's a fiction that it's a single self, right? And so we're always retrospectively putting back together the fragments of the past, right? To, to construct that sense of continuity. So I'm wondering if, you know, when he describes this experience of um, being up against the other, right? Um, being uh, fixed by the other, the way you fix a preparation with a die, right? Being the object of the other's gaze, right? That's when he loses his temper, explodes. And then the other me, that is later me, right? Kind of puts back together an understanding of what that was and who that was, right? Who had that had that experience. So I'm wondering if that's, part, I feel like maybe that that's the framework within which we have to kind of understand 
the looking back. Um, and chapter five is going to be a huge part of that. Yeah. Before before we move on to chapter five, I, I guess I should say that, uh, you know, in trying to figure out my thoughts on this book and to understand how it's been received, I've been looking at a few people talking about it elsewhere, and nobody digs deeply into the psychoanalytic language of the book. Really? Yeah. They're, they're, they they which is fascinating. Like if you, if you, from, from what I have read, which is not exhaustive and I'm not talking about like the most scholarly literature, but just like people who are appreciating it, appreciative essays and blog posts and YouTube videos and things like that about the book. Mm -hmm. Nobody really digs, nobody really prepares you for how much psychoanalytic theory is in several of the chapters of this book. Yeah. I guess it's because he, his impact is felt in the world of kind of political philosophy, right? And Maybe that's the reason for it, but that's really interesting, I think, because it would seem to me you'd have to have a handle on what he thinks he's doing in that framework to kind of understand the political, I would think, to understand the political philosophy, right? That's so interesting. I think that there are definitely things that you can get out of this book without knowing that, but you're going to be doing a lot of skimming. Yeah. And that's fine, but... Mm -hmm. (laughs) It was just interesting to to see that disconnect between because I, I spent the first several chapters of reading this book just psychoanalytic theory is not hmm. my cup of tea and it's never <laughs> I've never found it a particularly useful framework and I and I say that not wanting to take it away from people who do find it a useful framework I mean clearly it was very helpful for Fennel uh-huh. clearly it's very helpful for a lot of people and by saying that it doesn't work for me I'm not trying to say that the insights that it provokes at from people are invalid or anything like that. I'm not, not doing any of that. But just as a rhetorical strategy, it's just not, it just doesn't work for me. Mm, <laughs> um, mm, mm. So I spent the first several chapters wrestling with that quite a lot because that is so much of what's going on in those chapters. Yeah. And then turning to chapter five, everything stops getting so theoretical. It's less engaged with other people's texts and it becomes more what it seems to have always been all along. What I was what I was sort of getting out of it, even though he wasn't being as upfront about it as I wanted him to be, which is an investigation of his self. He spends a lot of time in those first chapters looking at other people's texts and other people's lives and having what felt like very personal reactions to it, but not usually admitting to how personal they were. Yeah. And then this is the time when it just becomes much more blatant, much more self-focused, and much more I don't want to say honest, but much more felt. Yeah. Well, I think it's, you know, that's so interesting because I think one of the things that's going on there is that chapter where he sort of delves into the personal and uses his own experience in in a more or less explicit way. It's really significant that it's framed within two chapters that are particularly focused on the psychoanalytical aspect. And I, and it's worth thinking about why he does that. And I wonder if part of the reason is it's a way of framing or contextualizing or even validating the personal experience he's going to put at the heart of it. In other words, he's making the argument, not exactly for universal experience, but for what he kind of alludes to as a different form or a new form of humanism, right? That you can reason outward from individual experience to say wider things, right? And so in order to position himself, his own experience in, to make it available in that kind of way, he has to frame it in terms of this psychoanalytical framework. And what's really interesting is, you know how we were saying earlier, he kind of opens up space in the Manichaean binarism, you know, for something to happen, for a way to get out of that stasis, that opposition of white and black and good and bad and dark and light and all that. He he talks in in chapters four and six about action, like what is possible, in particular what is possible for the black man. That's That's how he puts it. And he says, my objective, he says, is not to dissuade him by advising him to keep his distance, right, to not um, dig too deeply into what's going on around him and what he's perceiving, for example, through dreams. He says, on the contrary, once his motives have been identified, my objective will be to enable him to choose action or passivity with respect to the real source of the conflict, that is, the social structure. In other words, he's describing himself as in the role of the analyst, not the one who's analyzed there, right? He's saying, um, if I see somebody who's coming up against this, I'm not going to try to advise him to, you know, put things at a distance. I'm going to advise him to dig deeply in and to choose whether he chooses to be active or to be passive with regard to not just his own individual experience, his own psyche, 
but the social structure outside. And that's where psychoanalysis kind of meets revolution, I think, in Fennel's thought, right? You know, in other words, the solution is not just to get to get your head together. The solution is to get your head together and do and to choose to either choose to do something with regard to society or choose to be passive. But don't imagine you're not choosing whichever one of those two things you choose. Right. That, that's super interesting. I mean, so that, you know, in other words, you can't understand what he's saying in chapter five, I think, without understanding that he's talking not just about individual selves, he's talking about society and, and they go hand in hand. And then, you know, in, cha- in chapter six, again, he comes back to this, you know, this idea of choosing. Because what's happening is this. He says, since I realize that the black man is the symbol of sin, I start hating the black man, but I realize that I am a black man. I have two ways of escaping the problem. Either I ask people not to pay attention to the color of my skin, or else, on the contrary, I want people to notice it. I then try to esteem what is bad, right? In order to put an end to this neurotic situation where I am forced to choose an unhealthy, conflictual solution, there's only one answer. He says, skim over this absurd drama that others have staged around me, rule out these two elements, and reach out for the universal. When the black man plunges, in other words, goes down, something extraordinary happens. And I I found this passage really interesting. I had to read it a few different times to get a sense of what's happening. Um, I I think it's, it's about, again, that question of action, you know, not just whether you choose action for yourself as an individual, but whether you choose it for a society. That's the something extraordinary that happens. You know, so liberating the self through this psychoanalytical move, I guess Van Aul is saying, isn't just important because of what it might do for you as an individual person. It, it, make something happen. And again, that's the revolutionary. Anyway, so I, that's a really long way of saying, I think that's what those chapters, even those chapters are kind of like frustrating. That's what they're for. They provide the apparatus for chapter five to kind of sing. So chapter five, hmm. the lived experience of the black man. If you're going to read one chapter in this book, make it this one. <laughs> yeah. We chose the cold open from it, um, from, from the opening page of that chapter. And it's really powerful. I mean, in a couple different ways. How did it strike you? Well, it struck me as, first off, a radical tonal change. Mm. I mean, we had a little bit of it in the introduction, but here we suddenly have sort of well, not entirely left the theory stuff behind, but we are poetically describing moments in a life that had tremendous amount of impact on the creation of the psyche and how they fit together or don't. And yeah, there is some interpreting going along with it, but it keeps moving out of an analytical tone of voice and going into this much more rhetorical one, this very heightened register. And it's pretty good. (laughs) It's a pretty good register and it's pretty compelling. What about you? I also found the voice really striking. And also I found striking the ways in which centering the self, uh, as Fanon does in this chapter, meant just not not just centering the self like in terms of like, I don't know, subjectivity or spirit or something abstracted, but precisely body. Like he comes back to the body over and over and over again. And um, there was one passage that I found particularly evocative because it, again, gives you the sense of like the self and the body being kind of constructed over time in this really interesting way. And I just want to read a little bit because I thought it was so beautiful. Um, he's just come out of a passage where he's talking about lived black experience as, as in some ways kind of universal, but also specific in different places and times. So he talks about the experience of African Americans. He talks about people's experience in the Antilles. Um, and he's talked about France. So he, he, he's recognizing that there's different kinds of experience, but then he talks about the experience of what he calls confronting the white gaze. He says, then we were given the occasion to confront the white gaze. An unusual weight descended upon us. The real world robbed us of our share. In the white world, the man of color encounters difficulties in elaborating his body schema. The image of one's body is solely negating. It's an image in the third person. All around the body reigns an atmosphere of certain uncertainty. I know that if I want to smoke, I shall have to stretch out my right arm and grab the pack of cigarettes lying on the other end of the table. And I make all these moves, not out of habit, but by implicit knowledge. A slow construction of myself as a body in a spatial and temporal world, such seems to be the schema. It is not imposed on me. It is rather a definitive structuring of myself and the world, definitive because it creates a genuine dialectic between my body and the world. And it's kind of a long passage, but I find it so interesting in the ways in which it both 
makes it really clear is there's this thing outside, there's the white gaze, there's this atmosphere of certain uncertainty, there's all these constraints, but also, as he says, I move, I make all these moves. And uh, there's a slow construction of, he says, myself as a body. And the structuring of myself and the world and my body and the world seem to be like it, it, incredibly important understanding what he's talking about here in terms of individual experience, but also collective experience. Yeah. I, I love that he he chooses such a good example here. Just grabbing a pack of cigarettes, the sort of thing that you don't even feel like should be a thing, right? It doesn't mm-hmm. feel like it's a it's a battlefield. It doesn't feel like a, a, a movement that your relationship to society needs to be deeply interwoven in. It shouldn't be a giant source of trauma. And yet, mm-hmm, because mm-hmm. you're in this world and mm-hmm. you realize the expectations that are put upon you and your body and what you need to communicate to all the people around you who are looking at your body and bringing it into that world, your body is going to restrict itself and constrict itself into the shape it needs to be to pass by in this world. It's not, as it says, not imposed on him. It's not like nobody's sort of grabbing his hand and pushing it there. Nobody is specifically telling him, you need to do it this way right now. But it is a definitive structuring of myself in the world. It is it is there because it has to be that way through implicit knowledge. It's, I, I, it's something that I think most of us have sensed or experienced in some context or another when we've needed to police our body in some small, subtle way. Mm-hmm. And and just having it be that that pack of cigarettes is is a magnificent touch, I think. Yeah, no, I think you're right about that. About there being different set that that I don't know, there are different kinds of constraints and different ways in which that experience of you know having to structure the self and the world, the body and the world. I think that one could talk about that in terms of different different kinds of identities, right? Um, he's going to go on to bring this out in the really specific context of being a black man in France. Yeah. Right? Um, and again, though, this question of um, the role of the body is uh, constantly in the center. And again, it's pro- it's almost produced. Like, how can I put it? The bo- he, at the one and the same time, he has this body, but the body is also kind of produced by the exchange that's happening. In this chapter, one of the things he does is he describes a scenario where he's, um, like the technical term for it is interpolated. Right? It's a word that's often associated with the philosophy of Althusser a little bit later on. The idea that like same way if you're crossing the street and somebody goes, hey, you, you turn your head, right? Because you're in that moment interpolated, like you're kind of called into being, like you're you're recognized and you turn back to it. I mean, Fanon doesn't use that language for it, but he's describing this kind of moment. And he describes it, he says, Look, a Negro. It was a passing sting. I attempted a smile. Look, a Negro. Absolutely. I was beginning to enjoy myself. Look, a Negro. The circle was gradually getting smaller. Maman, look, a Negro. I'm scared. Scared? Scared? Now they are beginning to be scared of me. I wanted to kill myself laughing, but laughter had become out of the question. It's a really creepy moment (laughs) because it's terrifying, right? I mean, I wanted to laugh, but laughter had become out of the question. And and he's going to come back to this moment um, in the chapter uh, repeatedly in order to unpack what's going on there. And it is like the situation with the pack of cigarettes. It's this negotiation where your body, like you have your body, but also your body comes into being somehow through this negotiation with the world and through being seen, right? That white gaze. Yeah. And and your body is sort of rendered unrecognizable to yourself almost mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because, you know, your quote unquote natural reaction or his natural reaction in that moment was to laugh, was to keel over laughing, but he can't. And so his body is rendered unfamiliar to him because of this. Yeah. Just a couple of pages later, there's this passage, which it's like incredibly powerful and, and painful to painful passage. I'm going to read it. Um, we were talking about the voice of this chapter, and I, I feel like that voice is incredibly powerful here. And like I said, it's a painful passage. He says, my body was returned to me, spread eagled, disjointed, redone, draped in mourning on this white winter's day. The Negro is an animal. The Negro is bad. The Negro is wicked. The Negro is ugly. Look, a Negro. The Negro is trembling. The Negro is trembling because he's cold. The small boy is trembling because he's afraid of the Negro. 
The Negro is trembling with cold, the cold that chills the bones. The lovely little boy is trembling because he thinks the Negro is trembling with rage. The little white boy runs to his mother's arms. Mama, the Negro is going to eat me. I mean, it's such an awful passage. It's like heartbreaking. Yeah. But it's this defamiliarization you were just describing, right? Like that that comes from what Fanon calls in that slightly earlier passage, the definitive structuring of myself and the world, my body and the world. And this is the thing. This is the thing that he has to try to escape. It's not just the people, right? It's the whole thing. Yeah. But how, right? And, you know, this this keeps happening. And then a little further, uh, he says, you know, I feel the familiar rush of blood surge up from the numerous dispersions of my being. I'm about to lose my temper. The fire had died a long time ago. And once again, the Negro is trembling. Look how handsome that Negro is. The handsome Negro says, fuck you, madame. Her face colored with shame. At last, I was freed from my rumination. I realized two things at once. I had identified the enemy and created a scandal. Overjoyed. We could now have some fun. Mm -hmm. The battlefield had been drawn up. I could enter the lists. And so he's, you know, again, describing his experiences with negotiating this and like what to do, what can he do? And he finds an action that he can do, that he can take. And that, that is the next stage in the journey, so to speak, that he describes over this uh, over this chapter. Yeah. I mean, it's an amazing chapter. And it's interesting. It goes on. And towards the end of it, he ends up like, the last several pages of it, he ends up quoting all sorts of other writers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he's, he quotes a lot of other writers over the course of the book. He, primarily, he's quoting the poet and thinker M.A. Césaire, who was also from Martinique and who, in fact, was a teacher at the school he went to and was a big influence on him. And whose work is very interesting. I've only read a little bit of it, but it's all been fantastic. And it works out very well here. He, he, he quotes a few other people, but it's interesting how over the course of this chapter, by the end of it, it is, in a sense, not just his voice. Like, he brings in more and more other voices to echo and resound and re-universalize this as a way to transition back out into the more psychoanalytic, universalizing language that he's going to return to for the sixth chapter in the book, as we've already described. Yeah, I think that's a really important point that he brings these other voices in. That's one of the things that makes that second half of that chapter so extra. It's like you almost lose track of whose voice you're with. Exactly. Senor, César. Yeah, because this isn't just Fanon's experience. No. It is an experience that he finds, you know, widely shared. And also, you know, he has a good taste in mm. the writers that he quotes from. So, Black Skin, White Masks was published in 1952, and quite a lot has changed in the world since then in terms of how colonialism operates, but maybe not as much as we might have wanted. What is it like to read this book now, and what are people doing with this book these days? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a big and difficult question. The 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 way I can answer it is to kind of say, like, why did I want to read it now? Maybe. Sure. That, that's one I can. I mean, like you said, a lot has changed since 1952, but I feel like it's a moment when people are coming back around to talking about colonialism in, in various kinds of ways. So there was this kind of, like, without talking about it in detail, there was this period of time when the post-colonial was a really important subject of discourse. And whether it was being talked about in the South Asian context or in the context of African history or elsewhere in the world, there, there was a tendency, I think, to think about you know, colonial experience, then the post-colonial era. There's certain continuities, but there's also a radical disjunction. And so there's this idea that colonialism is a thing that you know, comes to an end and is processed in certain kinds of ways. But in, in more recent years, especially in the context of work that's happening in indigenous studies, there's work on colonialism that instead is very explicit in describing colonialism as um, it's sometimes said to be uh, a structure and not an event. Okay? And that formulation makes it really clear that it's not just like there's colonialism and then it's over, but rather it, it's a condition that persists. Right. And I think this is actually something that Fanon himself would acknowledge, right? That he, because he describes as this ongoing state of affairs in the discourse, right? Fanon specifically has kind of reemerged as an important figure for thinking through some of these issues. And there's a really fascinating book that came out in 2014 by um, Glenn Sean Coulthard called Red Skin, White Masks, Rejecting the Colonial Politics of Recognition. And I was just really struck by the way in which Coulthard uses Fanon to, to, not just to analyze colonial experience in Turtle Island or North America, but to specifically think about 
the, the role of affect. Like he doesn't particularly talk about psychoanalysis. He doesn't go into that space um, of, of Fanon's thinking that we've talked about a little bit together today. But the whole, the impassioned part, the anger, um, and what Coulthard ta- talks about in terms of resentment. Um, so there's a real power in Fanon's work that is continuing to be challenged and used in certain kinds of ways. And, and I'd like to say a little bit more about Coulthard. But before that, to say a little bit more about this question of colonialism, the post-colonial, and decolonization. Um, you know, in this framework where c- colonialism is understood as a structure and not an event, decolonization, how can I put it, um, becomes extremely complex to talk about and um, requires grounding in terms of specific real things like land back, water rights, um, financial compensation, any of these kinds of things. So so I feel like this is a really interesting moment to go back to Fanon and say, well, what 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 can we take for that? Like what do we maybe have to leave behind? And there's probably better left behind in 1952. And what are the things that are still really able to be mobilized in our present moment? Anyway, so I feel like that's that's really powerful in, in Fanon and continues to be generative. And that's maybe one strand in why I think he's getting reflected on again today, um, particularly. And there's probably other reasons as well. I would be curious to know more about that. Yeah, I had a chance to look a little bit at Coulthard's book, just a, just a, just a few sweet minutes to look through the introduction and get a sense of, of what he's going on about it. And it, it does look interesting. Um, it, 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 he's looking at things, it seems, in a, in a especially Canadian context, but mm-hmm. you know, understanding it to be applicable more broadly, uh, which I think is is completely fair. What were, what were some of the things that struck you about the book or about how he's using Fennel? Well, I was really, really interested in the ways in which he, like, as I said, before, picks up the sort of affective or emotional element. You know, Fennel talks a lot about, like, there's a lot about, like, the the, the affect, the anger, the, 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 the feelings, right, that are occasioned by being inside this colonial discourse, right? And um, Coulthard brings out that in the context of the truth and reconciliation process, right? And uh, Coulthard puts it really beautifully when he says, he says, in the context of Canadian settler colonialism, I contend that what gets implicitly represented by the state as a form of indigenous ressentiment, namely indigenous people's seemingly pathological inability to get over harms inflicted in the past, is actually a manifestation of our righteous resentment. That is, our bitter indignation and persistent anger at being treated unjustly by a colonial state, both historically and in the present. And so he says that this, um, what's often seen as a kind of angry and vigilant unwillingness to forgive, instead should be seen as an affective indication that we care deeply about ourselves, our land, and cultural communities, and about our rights and obligations. So in other words, um, Coulthard, I think, here is drawing on the articulation of anger and all that affect that we were just, we were noticing in Fennel, especially in Chapter Five, right? To to take that into the Canadian context and say what's being seen as a you know resentment and inability to get over the past, move on, you know, look toward the future. He's like, no, this is important and good, and he's grounding that I think in really interesting ways in um, in the affective engagements of Fennel. I, I thought that was really. Good. I mean, there's a lot more to say about Coulter, but I thought that dimension it was particularly interesting. It's not just the sort of abstract philosophical side. It's the passion part as well. Excellent. Yeah, that sounds fascinating. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess one of the reasons that, I mean, I know Fennel is in some ways a little bit hard reading and rough reading, I think we said, but I feel like, you know, it's a beautiful example of the way in which books kind of come back, right? It's like waves on a beach or something, you know, like they they mean different things and have different effects repeatedly, or at least, you know. A lot of books do, right? They do a certain thing in their own moment. They do another thing, you know. Uh, this uh, black skin white mass did a certain thing in the fifties. It did a certain other thing in the seventies, right? And I feel like it's doing something again now. And and I I kind of grasp like maybe one little corner of it, but I feel like uh, I really like to hear more about how people are responding to it um, in the present day. Well, that is going to be a, an interesting and rich book to have in the back of our minds as we read a wide variety of texts and talk about a wide variety of texts over the coming year. And we're going to start with another cluster, and this one is going to be on a topic that has become estranged to too many of us recently over the last few years. Oh, yeah. Which is the topic of time. It was actually one of my favorite topics, so I feel really good about it. 
Yeah, no, I'm, I'm <laughs> but fascinated you're right. with time. But People are all weird about it. I have no idea when anything happened in the last couple of years. I'm completely disoriented. Yeah, we, we, we've lost all track of it. Mm. So what books are we going to be looking at? Well, we're going to start out with Augustine's Confessions which I think will be really fun because his way of treating time is at once highly personal and highly abstract. And I think it'll be neat to unpack that. I have read this book many, many times, and I enjoy a lot about it. But there is something about this chapter on time that happens after a lot of people have put down the book, right? Most people, when they're reading it for college, don't read the last two chapters. Two or three. Two or three. I forget. Uh, But one of them is just a sort of philosophical treatise about time religious philosophical treatise, and it is fascinating. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I love that stuff. So we're going to really go to town with that. <laughs> yeah. We won't forget to pick out the juicy parts of the confession part that comes first, but... Uh, no, it, and time runs throughout the whole thing as well. Like It's true. But, but, mm, mm, going to have some fun there. And then we're going to go on to Zabald's Rings of Saturn, and then finally... Uh, and then finally, we're going to finish up the Commedia by looking at Dante's Paradiso. Which is super trippy. Where time grinds to a halt. In a really good way. <laughs> and then, so Rings of Saturn uh, might be the least familiar of the three for some listeners. Yeah. Sable's Rings of Saturn is a book that I've really uh, been wanting to introduce you to for a while. It's an itinerary, but it's also kind of got a montage quality to it. And um, the way in which it treats the passage of time, again, both a very personal and, I don't know, maybe universal or macrocosmic way, I think will complement the other books really well. It, it sounds really wild and weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what we're going to be talking about soon, uh, whatever that means, because time. We can't promise you a, a <laughs> no, schedule. No. It'll, it'll be timely, I promise. It'll be very timely, whenever <laughs> it happens. Time is no meaning. <laughs> In the meantime, if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at spouter at megaphonic.fm or we're on Twitter at The Spouter. We'd love to hear from you. And show notes with links for anything we've mentioned in this episode will be at megaphonic.fm slash spouter slash 52. And The Spouter Inn is one of the fancy little podcasts over at Megaphonic FM. So, until next time. Until next time. See you again at The Spouter Inn.